So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest. Joining us virtually from Washington, DC, Shannon McGann is the Chief Advocacy Officer for the National Association of Realtors. McGann is responsible for managing NAR's federal legislative and political affairs and representative teams. She provides strategic advice on public policy issues impacting NAR and helps direct its independent expenditures and public advocacy programs. Essentially, she's one of the most influential characters in Washington, DC, which is, that's not an overstatement. Joining her will be Sanjay Wagle. He is the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at the California Association of Realtors. He is the association's chief lobbyist and supervises the policy and political work of the Government Affairs Department. Sanjay received his law degree from the University of Southern California, MA from UCLA, and his BA from the University of Chicago. So how's that for credentials? And the individual, the woman who I'm sure needs no introduction to most everybody in this room, Carla Farley. Carla recently served as SDAR's 2020 and 2021 president. She's the broker owner of, of Corbin Realty, a full service sales property management brokerage. She's served in San Diego real estate for more than 26 years. And she's on the board of directors for both CAR and NAR. And she also served as the 2021 president of Smart Coast California, a 501c6 organization established by Realtors, which we'll be discussing shortly. So thank you all for being here today. Shannon, we're gonna go ahead and start with you. <laughs> From recent attempts to weaken the 1031 exchange to a proposal that threatened the independent contractor status of our members, 2021 was a busy year for you and your team in DC. Can you take two to three minutes to share a bit about what took place and where we're at? Well, hello, San Diego. I am um, very upset to not be with you there today. Uh, I am, uh, uh, you can tell I'm wearing a turtleneck and boots. <laughs> uh, it's been uh, a, a chilly winter here and we had an amazing time at our annual conference visiting with you all. And I'm just gonna go ahead and I, I think uh, we're, where we were um, uh, wanting to talk about 1031 like kind exchange and some of the advocacy successes that we have uh, seen so far. And uh, I would preface that with um, all of the successes First, I don't love using that word because I it's kind of there's more motion before progress and progress before success. And in BC, and as you know, in the advocacy community, oftentimes it's progress, but you know, you can't take anything for granted that things are are um, uh, completely finished or uh, or changing. So we have had some some progress and hopefully success on the advocacy front when it comes to looking at many of the tax proposals that have been out. Um, in the ether for several Congresses, but in particular this Congress, uh, and also on 1031 capital gains, uh, stepped up bases, things that may not sound like the most interesting when you're talking to the man on the street, but when you are dealing with the tax writing committees and what the means committee, which uh, has many influential California members on it, on uh, both sides of the aisle, um, are really big issues that came up uh, within the last year. And because of the advocacy support we have between the local, state, and national association, and the ability to uh, both anecdotally and fact-based tell the story of how these policies impact uh, private property purchases, investments in community, these are all uh, really important issues that we have been successfully telling that story and um, so far uh, seeing great results. It's often difficult to communicate to everyone what success looks like when something doesn't happen, but that is just as important as the things that do happen. So um, proactively supporting the passage of a bill is a uh, is obviously a, a big deal and something that we work every day on, but sometimes that means stopping the bad policies that could also impact the industry and the consumers uh, who we represent as well. And that's what we saw with um, 1031 and the capital gains increases the stepped up basis not being included as pay fors in the uh, build back better provisions. Um, you guys all probably are following the news just like uh, we are that um, it sounds like those those conversations uh, um, and the support that was as needed in the Senate for build back better. Uh, kind of stalled back in December. And I say stalled because I think that the, that, uh, the national media narrative kind of said now the bill is, is dead. It never is, nothing is. There's, it's still a live piece of legislation. Uh, I think the time frame that uh, the administration and congressional Democrats were 
hoping for um, was, was uh, not met clearly, but uh, that doesn't mean that, that uh, the game is over. Uh, it's still something that's being considered and we're still having those conversations as well. Um, and I'll kick it back over to you, Ryan. Just so you all know, she is being very humble. I can tell you that our team out in DC knocked it out of the park this past year. The 1031 exchange was at risk, independent contractor status, and a whole slew of real estate taxes were on the table. They have all but effectively taken that off. And you guys are familiar with the independent contractor status fight. So yes, I should have uh, mentioned that as well. I mean, these have been years of, of, of policy successes, uh, especially during the pandemic, starting with things like a, a essential services designation with every single state. Uh, the PRO Act is one that's still, again, um, a, a live piece of legislation that there uh, that we had some successful amendments to clarify that independent contractor status for realtors uh, would not uh, be included, but still something to monitor very closely uh, because everything I tell everyone, there's no such thing as a local, state, or national issue. Everything is one amendment of this piece of federal legislation. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, uh, maintain uh, that level of commitment and communication there, but it's been a, a very successful year. And we look forward to continuing that year. Thank you, Shannon. Now let's move a little bit closer to home, uh, moving to Sacramento. Uh, joining us is Sanjay and Sanjay, statewide eviction laws, SB 9 and 10, proposals to expand the authority of the Coastal Commission. Sacramento is always keeping us on our toes. Can you take a moment to share what all took place in 2021? Yeah, so let me uh, go over 2021. 2021 was actually a good year for us um, legislatively, both in terms of our proactive legislation that we were moving forward, as well as uh, what I would call the defensive legislation, where we had to basically try to stop things. Um, in terms of uh, proactive legislation bills that we were sponsoring, we had, a, we had a very robust fair housing package last year. All of those bills, which included you know, anti-poor door legislation, more robust fair housing training, uniform partition of heirs act. And those are those were our three sponsored bills. We also supported and were actually act very actively involved in helping to draft the bills uh, regarding appraisal discrimination issues and also uh, making it easier and um, a more proactive approach for removing restrictive, uh, illegal restrictive covenant language from deeds. Um, all of those passed, and but just to get a flavor of things, if you look at those, if you go to our, you know, the, the state website and you look at those bills, you're like, wow, sail through, no opposition, those must have been cake. No, 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 no. Every step of the way, even when it's easy, it's never easy. Meaning in terms of when it looks like, oh, it must have been easy. Everybody was on board. There was a ton of work in the scenes, a lot of controversy about certain, a provision here, a provision there, but uh, the fair housing, uh, uh, bills move forward uh, very strongly. We also did support very much the uh, efforts on SB9 and SB10. I, I do understand those are controversial measures, but CAR as board of directors did take a strong support measure. And with respect to SB9, um, our amendments that uh, to, to help address certain gentrification concerns or aggressive, that, that this could lead to much, too much aggressive new development uh, which requires an owner occupancy requirement was a CAR proposed amendment, which we believe helps address some of those concerns which uh, people had regarding the bill. Again, with respect to SB9 in particular, I don't, I don't know if new laws is before or after me or whether you've already heard from Gov. Um, the, the thing which we always talk about is make sure, read it, read it, read SB9 uh, before you, what you hear on media or on your Facebook channel. It's, uh, while it is a significant piece of legislation, uh, it's often not what people think it is. Um, AB, uh, we also did work on um, doing Proposition 19 uh, cleanup legislation, meaning just to make sure that the assessors had the guidance to be able to implement that. And that was a, a collective effort with the Fraser, uh, excuse me, with the assessors, as well as the Farm Bureau to make sure that that was done also something which uh, passed pretty pretty uniformly. Um, on the more challenging front, and, I'm good, and uh, I'll probably be talking about all these again when you talk, ask me about 2022, we were able to successfully stop last year a number of bills which were very concerning to us. Attempts to remove mortgage deductions on second homes, attempts to put rent, rental registries, attempts to um, 
make the Ellis Act, uh, to weaken the, the power of the Ellis Act, commercial rent control, development prohibitions um, in, in the wildlife urban interface, all of that we were able to stop last year. Many of those though are going to come back this year and in a more challenging environment. And I'll, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about it. Basically housing committee last year where we were able to stop a lot of those bills. And I, and I know those of your members who are kind of in the weeds with our politics might be like, wait, housing committee got worse? Well, housing committee was chaired by a member who often authored legislation that was unfavorable to us, but he also ran a committee in such a way that it was, it was um, where we had a fighting chance is the best way to describe it. That committee has been completely changed as of this year and is a very unfriendly committee for us. So, I mean, it might not be in terms of housing supply, we don't know yet, but in terms of a lot of our other issues, it's gonna be a very challenging committee. And so um, we are likely to see a lot of those bills that we were able to stop and prevent there last year, possibly making it coming back, possibly getting through and making these floor fights. So just, just a little heads up on that. But otherwise last year, as I said, not, not a lot. We were able to stop almost all the bad things. Um, uh, most of the agenda we were moving forward did, did pass. Um, you know, rental issues continue to be a challenge and that's gonna be more of a battle this year as a lot of those moratoriums, et cetera. Um, and we don't know right now whether there will be much of an attempt to do things on the state level. We are aware that locals are moving aggressively there. Thanks. Uh, you're definitely right on the local side of things, Sanjay, but I think you and I were talking earlier about the uh, potential for some ballot initiatives. Can you expand on, on some of that? And then just so everyone is aware, the conversations around uh, SB 9 and 10, those will be expanded upon through our conversations with Gov at the end of the program today. So he will be hitting home on those uh, on those issues there that were referenced by Sanjay. But uh, Sanjay, you yeah. mentioned uh, some of those uh, ballot initiatives. You want to tell the group what we might expect? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly touch on the ballot initiatives. And the one thing which I, it's possible you've heard me say before is don't panic yet, don't panic. Uh, because there are a lot of initiatives that it's not that expensive to file and to put together an initiative. Yes, you'd have to get attorneys or whatever on your side, but in terms of actually getting them put forward onto the ballot, and not onto the ballot, excuse me, to, to be able to collect signatures, et cetera, for them, it's not, that difficult. So just seeing those does not mean it's time to panic yet. The ones that are probably most concerning to us are ones which would change the way property tax is uh, reassessed in California. Um, it basically would create kind of a differential property tax rate. Right now, Prop 13 limitations, effectively 1%, not counting you know additional taxes here and there, um, but essentially 1%. This would create a differential rate for properties above 4 million uh, to 5 million, sort of in that. And that particular initiative would include all residential, including the home. Um, so that is of concern. What's also, they put sweeteners in though, to try to make that attractive to people because it would also increase the homeowner's exemption in the state to 200,000 from the current seven. So, um, but what's gonna happen with that? Uh, we don't know. Uh, there is some concern, and this is, this is sponsored by SEIU, um, but other labor, because the money doesn't necessarily go everywhere that all the other groups would like it to go. So it's not clear whether they will move forward with this. Um, but that is something which I know people are aware of and, and concerned about. There is another um, initiative, which is likely, again, when I say likely is, is, I understand there is some signature gathering going on, but uh, we'll have to see what happens because we haven't seen the big movements of money that are necessary to really get these things on the ballot, um, which, would, which would basically create a form of extreme local control over zoning and planning in the state. And when I say extreme, it would effectively, for example, get rid of Costa Hawkins, which as most of you are aware is the, is the law in California, which constrains extreme forms of rent control because it would return to the cities complete control over their zoning and, and land use. Um, as a practical matter, I just don't know how that would even work, right? Because basically every city becomes kind of an island. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but, but that is something also that is right now uh, circulating. We have seen some city um, in, embrace that initiative, but we haven't seen, well, they embrace it in the sense of, hey, we support this initiative. We haven't seen the money. And, and just to get a sense of it, it's going to be an expensive year. Um, 
just to explain how this process works. You have to spend the money for the signature gathering. You have to spend the money then to advertise and promote it. And it's going to be a very expensive year, frankly, because there's two gaming initiatives with, sports to, with, with regards to sports betting, which are in California. And we could see end up seeing hundreds of millions spent on both of those. So just, just something aware of, again, just don't panic yet or don't get concerned yet as they, as they move forward, we'll, we'll let you know. CAR, just as a general matter, does not take positions on initiatives um, that are, uh, unless it's, it's a real estate related initiative. Um, if 25% of the signatures have been obtained, there is the option for the board of directors to take a position. Once, if all signatures are obtained and it qualifies for the ballot, there is always a position taken, either neutral, favor, or opposed. All right, well, that information will certainly be shared as we know more. Uh, I want to move to Carla really quick. And then Shannon, I did have another question before you head out, and I appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, Carla, I know we just now were talking about uh, some issues relating to Costa Hawkins and uh, the evictions moratorium. Can you share a little bit about what took place in the county in 2021 that uh, folks should really be aware of as it relates to not only the policies coming down, but the speed at which they're moving? I'll tell you this, um, just going off of what Sanjay talked about, um, you know, locally in San Diego, and we know it's everywhere, but locally in San Diego, I don't know if um, many realtors probably thought this was just a property management type of an issue, right? And they got on the property management, so, so I don't have to worry about that. No, you, you have to worry about that. If you're a realtor, you're worrying about that. It was just not a property management issue. Um, Sanjay referenced, you know, for those of us who might be in the weeds of the politics of real estate, um, if you uh, have a real estate license in any form or work in this industry, you are in politics is how we survive. It's, uh, it determines how you work, if you can work. And so the eviction moratoriums impede on that as well. Um, yes, it dealt with the tenants and uh, private property rights and uh, so much to overreaching into the area of even telling you what you can do with your property or not. And even if you were gonna be homeless, what you could or could not do. And uh, that's where it just really went kind of far. Um, but for realtors working in the environment like that, we really, really have to be careful when you get into the risk management side of those things. Um, a lot of unintended consequences in this thing. Um, there's just catch 22s all through the whole process. Uh, the biggest one being unintended inheritance of tenants. <laughs> And in California, inheriting a tenant right now could be detrimental to you um, as a, a small uh, landlord or, you know, if that's your small business or whatever it is that you do, it could be detrimental. Um, and for agents, when you're transacting and passing a property over and not really having the appropriate disclosures or things that refer to what could possibly happen with these moratoriums in place. Um, you could put yourself, your brokerage, uh, a lot of people at risk. So we really want to make sure that you guys are being kept up on that. Um, this thing in San Diego, you know, the county supervisors dropped it on a Thursday evening. Uh, not within even in the time frame that their own guidelines give them to do. And so it was left with little time to respond. Uh, I'll say this, the government affairs at uh, SDAR is really quick about these things. And we were able to get people up and out really quick and on a call. Whether it would do a whole lot of good or not, we were there. And like Sanjay talked about, there are people in the background who are doing these things. Our CEO often talks about people, you know, they don't know what you're doing until you stop doing it. <laughs> and that's the thing we don't want to get to is where you really have to recognize what's not happening because we're not doing it anymore. Um, so there are a lot of people out there working on this. But Thursday, if you thought that was unintentional, I don't believe so. <laughs> it was probably meant that we couldn't respond in time. Um, the other thing Sanjay did, and I'll, I'll say, is that the county for San Diego, I know, is moving very aggressively when it comes to eviction moratoriums. Um, there's some new stuff that's going to come out in just a couple months. If this doesn't happen, we'll get another 60 days kicked in. And so, you guys really got to watch for this stuff. Um, it is very, very aggressive. It's pretty tough out there. And Absolutely. all those things do impact every single realtor there is out there, whether you do property management, uh, NSC spoke commercial land, whatever it is that you do, this stuff impacts everybody. Well, I do want to take a moment yeah. to recognize somebody that stood with us and, uh, and her, whose team 
uh, supported us, keeping us updated on what's going on. And that is uh, Supervisor Desmond, who just uh, entered the room a moment ago. Uh, he and his team were instrumental in uh, throughout this process, making sure our folks were aware of what was taking place, given especially the timeline in which we were notified. As was just said, this came down on a Thursday evening. That next day was Good Friday. This was coming up for a vote on Tuesday. So think about options for pub a public comment. Think about options for getting the word out on what that means. So that gives you an idea of the speed at which some of these policies are coming down and being introduced. So thank you, Supervisor Desmond. I look forward to you joining us on stage in just a short few moments for the next panel. Uh, with that, Shannon, I did want to turn things back over to you. Give us an outlook on what we can expect in 2022. Hopefully it's not, uh, not too much rain. We're looking for a little bit of shine. And uh, I don't know if you have any predictions on what we can, we can expect in the, uh, the House and Senate. Great, okay. <laughs> Uh, so as far as looking ahead to 2022, we have a brand new uh, session of Congress. We're back into a federal election year. Uh, happy New Year. Happy 22, everyone. So uh, other than Build Back Better, uh, which I mentioned earlier, that uh, that's still a live ball um, until there's another budget resolution. The current reconciliation resolution, BBB, uh, can be considered. So there's still time on that. Um, Congress also needs to strike a long-term spending bill uh, next month by February 18th. Uh, so, um, you know, increasingly Congress is uh, using continuing resolutions to fund the government. This is, you know, the kick the can down the road and will extend to a certain date. Uh, and this is kind of the uh, bread and butter uh, for advocacy because funding and is uh, often where a lot of these other programs come into place. Like things like we're supporting the full funding for um, their housing enforcement and others, and they're often in these types of legislation. So uh, we closely monitor that. And then we also look where other pieces of policy are attached to these funding bills, which is again, something that's been increasingly done over the last several Congresses, it's not new. Uh, so that's things like the flood insurance program, which goes along that same track. Um, and then the congressional calendar uh, is traditionally fairly light in an election year. Um, there are other things to focus on and you'll still see the, the kind of partisan back and forth, but typically uh, the heavy lifts when you have a new administration in town and a new Congress in town is within that first year, which is where we saw American Rescue Plan, um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and then build back better. Uh, uh, clearly, um, COVID and, and further COVID responses are still being discussed. It's still a bit of a, an unknown. Uh, the same thing with inflation, which is being discussed uh, quite regularly on Capitol Hill as well. Uh, and so that could be something to get some traction. Uh, but, you know, we're always asked, like, kind of how, you know, you have this new session of Congress. What are your new advocacy priorities? Well, um, I hate to um, uh, disappoint, but um, we will continue our work. It's going to be, uh, uh, we're, we're putting together our mid-year talking points um, as a continuation of our priorities from last year, which is all in the same Congress. Um, that's ensuring a quick economic recovery post COVID. We're still in COVID, but that's something where we've had uh, um, very uh, positive conversations, both with the administration and Capitol Hill about the state of the real estate economy, uh, what consumers are looking for in this market, uh, and how we can um, address the, the, the top issue with the market, which is inventory, and what we call the, the three A's of housing, accessibility, availability, and affordability. So those are all our continuation uh, with several pieces of legislation that are both bipartisan and bicameral uh, to continue um, uh, uh, fighting for those. Uh, the other is ensuring fair housing for all and including our, our calls for increased housing and full, and um, I'm sorry, increased funding and uh, uh, full funding for the fair housing programs that we're working on, including testing and other things. Um, building strong and resilient communities and businesses, which is looking at things in the infrastructure space in uh, addition to the bipartisan bill. Uh, um, you know, there's a there's several very robust policies on um, first generation, uh, first time, first generation uh, uh, down payment assistance and other homeowner initiatives that are happening at the federal level as well. Uh, and that includes the improving access to home ownership. So, thank you. Thank you uh, again, so we've much, had yeah. major uh, progress, successes, if you will, on all fronts last year. And um, this is an, an important year to keep that momentum going. I'll kick that back over to you, Ryan. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, Carla, I know we're in the last few minutes of our program, and this is a lengthy conversation. I, I just got the sign that it's two minutes left in the program. 
Not sure if you can hear me, but uh, as the 2021 president of, of Smart Coast California, you helped to secure more than $1 million in grant funding from CAR and NAR to support the organization's efforts to respond to sea level rise policies. Can you take a few minutes to explain why this funding and the organization itself is necessary? And I'll mute myself. I, I, I think I got the gist of the question. Um, but in that whole sea level rise, I'm not gonna wrap up really quick here. Let me first just even say a big thank you to Sanjay and Shannon here um, for CAR support that they've given to Smart Coast California. Um, that support actually helps us demonstrate just how powerful the real community is when we get together and that strength that we put the support in our advocacy efforts uh, that support the industry, the property owners and our members interest. Um, that funding is critical to Smart Coast. Um, since it is, as we know of today, the only realtor association led advocacy organization. So Smart Coast California, of course, deals with sea level rise, its impact, um, alternative armoring mechanisms that could be used, uh, community assistance and education around the Coastal Commission. Those funds help us do that. Smart Coast was created in response to the Coastal Commission actually pressuring cities to adopt uh, a very far reaching and uh, concerning provision that threatened our coastal communities. A lot of people don't know that the jurisdiction for the Coastal Commission actually goes inland about three miles. That's a lot of properties that are in there. And so they really have quite an influence over a lot of property. Um, the advocacy, the research, raising awareness, the education, all of those things with our elected officials, municipalities, communities, property owners alike, um, Smart Coast is able to do that. Um, but again, without the help of CAR, uh, that, that would be stifled. Um, the professional voice that you can have researching, uh, being able to have presentations that you can make, they make a big difference out there. We get a lot of people, community, um, even legislators who do not know the impact until they get to the point of seeing that uh, the property is about to be taken. And at that point, it's a little too late. So with some of the provisions that were being put in place, we're able to educate people, actually go uh, to Coastal Commission um, hearings and actually uh, report and help them understand what is happening in their community so that they can fight back. So Smart Coast California is very, very important. I know we have some of that coming up in the risk management section, um, if you guys wanna get into it a little bit deeper, but with the two minutes, I, I think I put enough of it in there. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, we'll hope so, but you did a great job for anybody that is involved with transactions along the coast, for anybody that has clients uh, in the coastal areas, you need to be paying attention to this topic. This is something that all of our cities throughout the county are moving on. And that is look, look, updating their local coastal program amendments to account for sea level rise. This could have tremendous impacts on our private properties, the ability of homeowners to have access to seawalls, have access to other protective devices, that'll ensure the protection of their investment in their property for the years to come. So we have several programs lined up that we will continue to bring before you to educate you about this. And again, this is something that we are actively engaged on up and down the coast. And thanks to Carla, who served as the 2021 president for Smart Coast California. And again, to our colleagues at NAR and CAR who have supported this now with over a million dollars just this past year in grant funding. So with that, I can see that we're out of time. I just wanna say thank you so much to Shannon, Sanjay and Carla for joining us today. And uh, we'll work to, uh, to make sure that next time we have some better audio so you might actually be able to, uh, to hear what I'm saying to you. <laughs> so thank you guys.